Hey everyone, this is a piece by Robert J. Uh, well, this is not a piece, but it's the introduction uh, to Robert J. Alexander's uh, Maoism in the Developed World. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm probably going to read uh, this book just the way I've read the uh, Robert J. Alexander's book on international uh, Trotskyism. Probably just kind of, you know, uh, read different entries from it at my leisure. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess I'll just, you know what, I'll read the table, I'm going to read the table of contents in the preface, too. Um, so, uh, let's see. You know, I'll just read them kind of rapid fire off, um, just to, you know, say what's in the book. Um Part one is about the United States and Canada. There's a chapter on Maoism in the United States and Canada, the Progressive Labor Party, U.S. Maoist originating in the new left of the 1960s, Canadian Maoism. Part two, Europe, Maoism in non-communist Europe, Austrian Maoism, Belgian Maoism, Maoism in Cyprus, French Maoism, Maoism in the German Federal Republic, Maoism, which I've already read, Maoism in Great Britain, Greek Maoism, Irish Maoism, Italian Maoism, Maoism in Luxembourg, Maoism in the Netherlands, Portuguese Maoism, Maoism in San Marino, Maoism in Scandinavia, Maoism in Spain, Swiss Maoism, Turkish Maoism, Part 3, Oce Asia and Oceania, Japanese Maoism, Australian Maoism, Maoism in New Zealand. I'll read the preface here. This is the second volume of my study of international Maoism. It deals basically with Maoism in the, quote, developed countries. However, in the case of the European nations, it varies a bit from this pattern, including all those nations which during the Cold War period were not controlled by communist parties. It thus deals with such nations as Greece, Cyprus, and Portugal, which are not exactly, quote, developed in the economic sense. Nevertheless, historically and politically, they have more in common with other European countries than they do with those of the so-called third world, particularly during the period in which international Maoism has existed. One, quote, technical comment is in order. This concerns orthogra orthography. Generally, I have used the old-fashioned spelling of Chinese proper in place names instead so, I mean, since during most of the period covered by this book, the Chinese themselves used that spelling and it appeared in most of the published sources we use. However, where sources were, quote, we, quote, use the new transliteration into English, we faithfully reprint that. I have used two principal sources of information in working on this. One is the yearbook on international communist affairs, which the Hoover Institution... Um, I don't need to tell you about the Hoover Institution, published over a period of more than two decades. The other consists of documents of the Sozialistische Einheit Partei Deutschland, SED, the Communist Party of the former German Democratic Republic, which were originally not for general distribution but became available after the fall of the Berlin Wall. I owe debts of gratitude in connection with each of these sources. On the one hand, I must thank the Hoover Institution for permitting me to quote more or less extensively from its volumes. On the other, I am obliged to Dr. Norbert Matlock for making available to me the East German Communist Publications and to Professor Max Goyel of the Rutgers Psychology Department and to a graduate student in that department, Michael Diefenbach for helping me decipher the German in which the SED documents are written. Professor Justus van der Kruf, <coughs> I don't know if I'm saying that right, of the University of Bridgeport has been kind enough to make available to me a valuable article he wrote on the Maoists of Australia. Similarly, Professor Eric S. Einhorn of the University of Massachusetts in Amherst provided important leads concerning Scandinavian Maoists, and Mads Brun Pedersen, a Danish historian of the Marxist movements in Scandinavia, was kind enough to m provide me his own observations and several important documents on the Danish of the Danish Maoists. 
And as he had done with several of my recent books, Eldon Parker has done a magnificent job of converting the original manuscript into a camera-ready copy, for which he has my thanks. Also, as has been the case on several earlier occasions, I am obliged to Dr. James Sabin of the Greenwood Publishing Group for his interest in having this volume see the light of day. And I must thank Nina Sheldon for copy editing and Nicole Cornoyer for otherwise seeing this volume through to publication. Finally, as always, I owe much to my wife Joan for putting up with me while I worked on away on this volume, often when clearly she might have preferred that I be doing other things. Introduction. International Maoism had its origins in the split that developed in the 1950s after the death of Stalin between the Soviet and Chinese Communist parties and regimes. The schism was perhaps as dear to being inevitable as anything in human affairs. Given the nature of Marxist-Leninist ideology, particularly as Marxist-Leninist Marxist ideology developed after the Bolshevik Revolution of November 1917, there could be only one center from which the, quote, correct interpretation of that ideology came. So long as the Soviet Union remained the only country governed by a Marxist-Leninist Communist Party, it remained the place of origin of such an interpretation, and so long as he lived, Joseph Stalin continued to be the person whose interpretation was definitive. Even the emergence of communist regimes in most of the East European states immediately after World War II did not significantly change the situation. None of the parties in those countries controlled a nation of sufficient importance to form the basis for a major split in the international communist movement. This was borne out by the fact that the one schism that did take place in those years, that is, that of the Yugoslav party, did not give rise to any significant challenge to Stalin's leadership of international communism. However, the advent of the Chinese Communist Party to power in 1948-49 drastically changed this situation. China was a nation containing one quarter of the human race, and although the country remained poor and underdeveloped, it had the economic and military potential to become one of the world's major powers. Sooner or later, it was all but inevitable that differences of opinion between the Chinese and Soviet parties would give rise to a challenge on the part of the Chinese leadership to the priority of the Soviet party leadership within the world communist movement. So long as Stalin lived, no such split took shape. Over many years, Stalin had been accepted by the leaders of all the communist, Stalinist, parties, there's Stalinist in parentheses here, parties as the source of Marxist-Leninist wisdom and policy. Furthermore, although there are indications that Stalin did not particularly want the Chinese communists to come to power, Stalin was wise enough to extend the Chinese communists considerable economic and other aid once they won the Chinese Civil War. <laughs> yeah, that's my understanding, is that the Chinese Stalinism is kind of um, indigenous and native to... Uh, itself it wasn't like a externally coordinated thing to my understanding um and that i think that's also the be also the similar case of like yugoslavia uh, yugoslavia was a smaller country but it came to uh, uh prominence not because the red army uh extended into its uh territory like it did in other parts of eastern europe but because of its uh you know home uh grown um efforts. That's my understanding, at least. I might be wrong. However, the situation fundamentally changed with Stalin's death. Thereafter, the Chinese communists did not feel that his successors spoke with the authority they had recognized in Stalin. They had good reason to believe that their own principal leader, Mao Zedong, was the senior and most authoritative leader in the world communist community. He had led his party to victory in a struggle spreading over more than two decades, and Mao was a, quote, theorist of consequence, traditionally a requirement for a major leader in international communism. In addition, Mao governed the world's most populous country. Therefore, as disagreements emerged between Mao and his associates on the one hand and Nikita Khrushchev and other post-Stalinist leaders of the Soviet party and government on the other, the Chinese felt under no compulsion to accept the ideas and interpretations of events of the Soviet leaders as being inevitably correct. 
A disagreement arose over a number of issues. One of the first was Khrushchev's famous, quote, secret speech to the 20th Congress of the Soviet Party early in 1956, in which Khrushchev excoriated Stalin. The Chinese leadership felt that that speech was a major mistake and undermined the communist movement throughout the world. Shortly afterward, the Chinese were very critical of the Soviet leader's handling of the uprising in Hungary against the communist regime there and the near revolt against the one in Poland. Then, early in 1958, the Chinese launched the so-called Great Leap Forward. This was a clear break with the Soviet model of Marxist-Leninist economy and society, which they had until then followed. It sought to reorganize the economy on the basis of, quote, communes, which they pictured as a, quote, higher form of society than that prevalent in the USSR and other, quote, socialist states. Khrushchev was reported to have regarded the Great Leap Forward as both ridiculous and disastrous. There also developed basic differences of opinion concerning relations between the Marxist-Leninist-controlled countries of the world and the West. The Chinese rejected the so-called peaceful coexistence policy expounded by Khrushchev and dismissed his emphasis on the dangers of a nuclear war, advocating instead confrontation with the United States and the rest of the world uh, and the rest of the West. Um, if you're interested, uh, look up some of Mao's comments on uh, nuclear war. Um, until 1960, these disagreements took place behind closed doors, so to speak, but in July of that year, the Soviet government suddenly announced that it was canceling its economic aid program to China and was withdrawing all the several thousand technicians who had been helping the Chinese economic development programs. Thereafter, the conflict between the Chinese and Soviet parties and governments became increasingly open. An attempt to find common ground at a meeting of more than 80 communist parties from around the world held in Moscow in 1960 utterly failed. The central committees of the communist parties of the Soviet Union and China began exchanging bitter public letters with one another. In the beginning, the Soviet party engaged in violent attacks on the Albanian party, the only party in power that supported the Chinese, and the Chinese attacked with equal vehemence the Yugoslav party toward which Khrushchev had made overtures seeking to patch up the split that Stalin had provoked several years earlier. However, each side soon began openly disputing the positions taken by the other. Finally, in 1963, the Con Chinese party decided to take, control take the controversy to the world communist movement in general. They welcomed the support of the handful of parties that had aligned themselves with the Chinese in the dispute and undertook to encourage splits in the parties whose allegiance still lay with the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. The present volume deals with the Chinese effort to split the world communist movement insofar as the parties in the developed countries, the United States and Canada, Europe, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand, are concerned. Although the most substantial parties to side with China were in the developing world, in the countries contiguous to China, in Latin America, and in some parts of Western Asia, Maoism was by no means confined to them. As we shall see, one of the first Maoist parties to be established was in the United States. For reasons of its own, the traditional New Zealand party joined the Maoist ranks from the beginning. The only former member party of the common turn to do so. And there were schismatic Maoist parties established in virtually all of the West European countries. The Japanese party wavered in its allegiance for some time, and a three-way division finally occurred in Japan. Chinese support for schismatic Maoist communist parties continued as long as Mao Zedong was alive. However, Mao was not only the leader of the Chinese party, but also controlled the Chinese government, and over time his evolving policies in the latter had a, an unsettling effect on the Maoist parties outside of China. This was particularly the case with his development in the early 1970s of a rapprochement with the United States. For a short while after Mao's death, the Chinese party, under the leadership of Hua Kuo Feng, continued the policy of encouraging international Maoism. However, Hua's showdown with the so-called Gang of Four uh,
Madame, right, it's M-M-E Mal, I guess it's uh, Mal's wife, whose uh, name I can't um, remember right now, and three colleagues, which brought about their imprisonment caused further problems for the Maoist parties outside of China. Some of them split between groups still loyal to the Chinese party leadership and those who supported the Gang of Four. A further complication was presented by the Albanian party. It had remained loyal to Mao as long as he lived, but was unwilling to support Mao's successors. Before long, it even began in retrospect to be highly critical of Mao Zedong himself, thus promoting even more dissidents within the ranks of the Maoist parties. The Albanians began their attacks on Mao by taking issue with the so-called Three Worlds Theory contained in a document issued by the Chinese leadership soon after Mao's death and attributed, and attributed to Mao. According to it, the world was divided into three segments, the first world consisting of the two, quote, superpowers, that is, the United States and the Soviet Union, the, quote, second world consisting of Western European nations and Japan, and the, quote, third world made up of the developing countries, the leader of which was China. From their repudiation of the three worlds theory, the Albanian leadership extended their attacks on Mao to the whole body of Mao's theory and practice. Some hitherto Maoist parties in other countries aligned themselves with the Albanians. There thus came to be three identifiable tendencies among the parties making up international Maoism, those still loyal to the new ruling Chinese group, those supporting the Albanians, and those proclaiming themselves to be the, quote, true Maoists, who continue to preach the doctrine of the Mao of the, quote, great proletarian cultural revolution, end quote, and declared their support for the Gang of Four. funny i'm reading this thing right now and it has like these old spellings of names uh, i guess before this kind of new uh what's it called transliteration of uh chinese and so i'm like you know it has like these original ones and i'm like uh you know going to pronounce them wrong and i'm like who the fuck is ting shu ping and i was like oh deng xiaoping deng, deng xiaoping However, with the ascent of Deng Xiaoping to power after 1978, the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party lost virtually all interest in international Maoism. Tang and his colleagues turned their attention principally to the economic development of their country, took large strides towards establishing a market economy, and had little further interest in the international communist movement, Maoist or otherwise. Although by the 1990s, international Maoism had not ceased to exist, international Maoism had come to be confined to a small group of small organizations, principally in Asia and South America, the most notable of which was the so-called Sendero Luminoso Communist Party of Peru, uh, Shining Path. Um, Sendero being path in Luminoso, I guess, being Shining. Uh, among the developed countries, many of the Maoist parties had disappeared and others were much weakened. A few of the surviving parties of the more, quote, orthodox variety had for the first time established what amounted to a Maoist international, the Revolutionary Internationalist Movement. The formation of the Revolutionary Internationalist Movement tended to highlight one of the peculiarities of international Maoism. Until then, no attempt to form a Maoist version of the Communist International had ever been made by Mao himself or by the Chinese party at any time. All relations between the Chinese party and those elsewhere, which were Maoist, were on a party-by-party -party basis, rather than taking the form of establishment of an international organization. In sum, it can be said that international Maoism constituted, so long as Mao lived, the most consequential schismatic movement within international communism since it came into existence in 1919 with the establishment of the Communist International, although international Trotskyism has had a much longer existence dating from 1929 and still is in existence at the end of the 20th century, it has never had as many parties associated with it 
nor has it had parties of the importance of some of those that rallied to the banner, banner of Mao Zedong. International Maoism was the only schismatic tendency in the history of the communist movement to have had the support of a major country. Its fate rested largely on whether or not that power, China, continued to maintain that support. Note. For a more extensive treatment of the origins and evolution of international Maoism, see Robert J. Alexander's International Maoism in the Developing World. Thanks for listening.